Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Lauren Lee Barreau. Um, so this morning, we're going to talk to you about um, the Developmental Disability Service System and some of our new programs and initiatives. Um, so I'm going to skip through this part. Um, okay. So uh, Tiffany and I work for uh, the California DDS, or the Department of Developmental Services. And we are a state agency. Um, we do um, oversee some state-operated services that we're going to mention. Um, someone's waving at me. Speak up. Is this better? Is that too loud? OK. Good. All right, so we work for the Department of Developmental Services, and our department oversees a few state-operated programs for people with disabilities, and we're going to talk about those a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but we also contract with 21 private um, nonprofit organizations or regional centers. The regional centers are located across the state, and the regional centers vendorize with local community providers, and then they also provide service coordination for individuals with disabilities. Um, so they're really the heart and soul of the Lanterman Act, providing case management for individuals and access to services. Okay, so our regional centers vary by location in the state, um, but they also vary by size. So um, you can see on the chart here, the very smallest regional center is Redwood Coast with about 4,000 individuals. Our largest regional center is uh, Inland Regional Center, who's serving just over 37,000 individuals. So there's a lot of variability in terms of how many individuals are being served, and then there's going to be variability by geography and then um, the makeup of the individuals at each regional center. So there's going to be variability in terms of which diagnoses are being served, um, the different ethnicities and language, languages being spoken as well. All right, this is our total population um, from 2009 to 2019. So we've experienced about a 50% increase uh, in our caseload over the last 10 years. Um, so we had a, a little over 200,000 individuals in 2009. Now we're serving um, almost 360,000 um, as of January. And on the chart here, the two colors represent our different age groups. So in blue, that's early start, so individuals who are zero to three, and then uh, the green that makes up our largest portion of the caseload would be individuals who are, we call status two or Lannerman eligible, and that's ages three and up. So most of the individuals we serve are three and up. All right, this is looking at our population by age group. So on the far left, we have zero to two, then three to 17, 18 to 21, 22 to 51, and then 52 and older. Um, so we're seeing an increase in the share of all of these age groups, um, but our largest groups are really uh, middle childhood um, and then young adults. Um, but I will say, uh, as these individuals age, we're also seeing an increase in uh, our aging adults with disabilities. So individuals who are 52 and older, um, that number is growing. All right, by diagnosis, um, to qualify for regional center services, an individual has to have one of the diagnoses listed here. Um, so autism, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, intellectual disability, and then other or fifth category, and that would be any developmental disability that resembles something like an intellectual disability and requires similar services and supports. Um, so uh, I do want to mention um, these categories are not mutually exclusive, so one person could have more than one diagnosis, and that's going to be represented here. So if you're doing the math right now and the percentages add up to more than 100%, that's why someone might have autism and ID at the same time, uh, and they're going to be counted in both of those buckets. Um, and we're seeing an increase in the raw numbers of all five of these categories. So more individuals which with each of these categories um, are coming into our system every year. But I do want to point out in terms of the share, so the proportion of each diagnostic category, we're seeing an increase in the share of autism over all of the other categories. All of our other categories, their share, or their proportion is going down. Um, so we're seeing a really rapid increase in the number of individuals with autism in our system, and they're taking up a larger and larger share of who we're serving. 
All right, this is our population by ethnicity. So we have Asian, black, and African American. Um, on the bottom, white and Hispanic. And then in the middle, we have other, which would be any other ethnic group that's not represented um, by the other four categories here. That would also include individuals who are multiracial. Um, and uh, I think the most significant thing to point out here is um, 10 years ago, our largest share uh, were individuals who identified as white. And now um, our largest share would be Hispanic or Latinx. Um, so they're representing 40% of our population now. So we've seen a really big shift in terms of ethnicities and the languages um, being spoken in our system. Um, and that's gonna have a, a role in when we think about developing services and supports for individuals with disabilities, making sure that those services and supports um, are culturally and linguistically sensitive uh, and appropriate for individuals with disabilities. Um, so we wanna make sure that there's access for everyone, um, regardless of their background. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over to Tiffany now and she's gonna talk to you about our community development. Good morning. So community development is very important to our service delivery system. Uh, the community placement plan is something that started in the year 2000, and this established the Welfare and Institutions Code 4418.25. Um, it's meant to support individuals with developmental disabilities um, in the development of resources out in the community. And initially, it was developed to support individuals that were living in more restrictive environments so that resources could be developed in the community for them to transition into, to a less restrictive environment. Over the past 10 years, there's been a focus on the Developmental Services Task Force work, as well as the closures of the developmental centers. This has given us the opportunity to increase our community development. Also, in 2005, we had the opportunity to create the Buy It Once model. This is a housing model which separates the ownership of the home from the services that are provided to the individuals in the home. This preserves the longevity of the home itself. In 2017, Community Placement Plan took a shift and we added the Community Resource Development Plan. This is the Welfare and Institutions Code 4679. This gave new opportunities for those that are already living in the community. Examples of the projects might be the development of multifamily housing or early intervention projects. Also, community resource development planning is driven at the local level by the regional centers. They use data and stakeholder engagement to determine the local needs. The community resource development planning gives the opportunity to respond to the changing needs, such as rising numbers in autism, uh, consumers with Down syndrome, and dementia. So during this expanded time of community development, new housing models have been created. These new models are supportive for individuals with more complex needs. The enhanced behavioral supports homes provide non-medical care for individuals who require enhanced supports. Staffing and supervision is provided at an enhanced level in this home-like model. The community crisis homes were also added uh, as a new model, also a non-medical model, for individuals who are in need of crisis intervention services in a residential setting. These individuals may otherwise be at risk for admission to a state-operated facility, or out of state, or admission to an institution of mental disease, or an acute care facility. Both models are licensed by Community Care Licensing, and they're certified by the Department of Developmental Services. Both the department and the regional centers provide regular monitoring of these homes. Both models can provide for enhancements to the home, very individualized to the individual's needs, can provide for extra staffing and additional staff training. 
The safety net of resources is another vital part of our services. The department is working with a few of the regional centers at this time in the development of specialized step-down homes. Currently, these are community crisis homes, and the intent is to support individuals transitioning from the institutions of mental disease as well as the secure treatment area of Porterville Developmental Center. Also, the individualized intensive transition services have been created. The intent here is to support individuals before, during, and after their transition from the secure treatment area of Porterville Developmental Center. Okay, another one of our safety net initiatives is the Individualized Intensive Transition Services. Uh, and this is really two uh, programs um, that are pretty similar, um, but are focused on different populations. So we have an intensive transition service for individuals who are transitioning out of the Porterville Developmental Center uh, Secure Treatment Program, which is a state-operated program um, for individuals who are um, going through competency training um, or maybe um, uh, court-mandated to be in that program. Um, and then we also have an intensive transition program for individuals who are at institutions for mental diseases, so uh, a place like College Hospital. And this program is meant to transition those individuals from those uh, secure treatments to the community. A lot of times those individuals um, have very complex needs, challenging behaviors. Um, they may have a history of severe aggression. Um, and a lot of times providers don't want to take them because of those reasons. Um, but this service is really meant to make sure that those individuals have a safety net or, or very strong wrap services that are going to make that transition successful and, and make them successful in maintaining that placement after they move. Um, so uh, for the individuals transitioning out of uh, the Porterville Secure Treatment Program, um, we have Liberty Healthcare um, who's running this service. For the individuals transitioning out of the Institution for Mental Diseases, uh, Meriki is running this service. Um, but the service really provides um, really intensive wraparound so they're uh, coming in before the individual moves, working, that, working with the individual to identify risks, uh, identify their goals, their strengths, um, what they want to do when they get to the community. They come up with a really intensive transition plan. Um, they're working with the facility where they are, and they're working with the placement where they're going um, to make sure that there's going to be a smooth transition. Um, and then they follow that individual after they move. Um, and they're going to be there as long as that individual needs to be stable and successful in the placement. So um, they're going to be connecting that individual to supports in the community, um, things like a day program or employment, if that's their goal. Um, and then depending on that individual's specific needs, they may also be providing access to specific therapies. Um, so some individuals may need things like uh, anger management, sexuality training, um, training related to substance abuse. Um, these programs are making sure that the individuals have access to that as well. So that's our individualized intensive transition services. Um, we also have, as part of our safety net, the STAR program. And this is another state-operated program. And this is uh, acute crisis um, intervention. Uh, and it's uh, a time-limited program. So individuals can stay in the STAR program for up to 13 months. Um, so long enough for them to get stable, and then they transition either back to the placement where they came from or a new placement. Um, and this program has been running for a few years, um, but what's new about it um, now is that we're moving the STAR program into the community. So initially, our STAR programs were located at Sonoma Developmental Center and Fairview Developmental Center in the north and south of the state. Um, and we're now moving into the community. So in the north, we have a one-star home open in Vacaville for adults. Um, very soon this year, we'll have a second home in Vacaville for adults. And then coming on later this year, we'll have a third home in Vacaville for children. Um, in the south, the STAR program is still uh, located on the Fairview campus, um, but we will have two homes opening um, by the end of the year uh, for adults in the Costa Mesa area. And then right now, we also have a STAR unit open uh, at Porterville Developmental Center. Um, so in the Central Valley, that unit is operating for adolescents. Um, and 
Uh, by next year, we should have uh, one home open in the Central Valley for adults and then another home for adolescents. Um, so this program um, has been really, really successful in um, taking individuals in acute crisis um, with very challenging behaviors, um, getting them stable, and then moving them back out into the community. Um, we're really excited to see this program becoming even more integrated, um, opening those homes directly in the community so that um, immersion in the community is part of the program. Connected to our STAR program, we also have CAST. And this is a mobile crisis program, so staff um, from STAR uh, who have a lot of experience in crisis and mental health issues for people with disabilities, um, they uh, make up our CAS team that goes out and does um, assessments, provides recommendations, um, and does training for families or providers. Um, so this program has, has been um, really pivotal in um, giving individuals and the regional centers that they're connected to some more ideas and more resources that they can um, connect individuals and their families to so that they don't have escalations that require the individual to move to a more restrictive placement. All right, the last program I'm gonna talk about is our newest safety net program, um, and this is START Services. Um, so the START model uh, is based out of the University of New Hampshire. It's been running for about 30 years uh, and is operational in um, 13 or 14 states now. Um, and this is an evidence-based model that works on preventing crisis. So um, this model has uh, peer-reviewed papers um, and uh, published uh, state reports that indicate uh, this model is successful in reducing psychiatric hospitalizations, visits to emergency departments, um, and keeps about 80% or more of their individuals in their placement. Um, so we were really excited to bring this model to California for the first time. So we have two teams currently. Um, they started just this past fall in 2019. We have a team uh, at San Diego Regional Center and a team at San Andreas Regional Center. They're operated by two local providers um, with experience um, in mental health and crisis. Um, and those teams are providing start services to individuals with disabilities in the community who are regional center consumers. Um, and they provide uh, crisis case management. They come up with a really comprehensive crisis plan for the individual and their family. They do 24-hour um, crisis calls. They will go out at any time, night or day, um, to talk to the individual, meet with the family, um, de-escalate the situation. Um, they also do in-home coaching or on-site coaching. So they will go into the home and teach skills to the family and the individual um, to manage behaviors, to give the individual coping skills um, so that they're not um, relying on that response every single time. They start developing the skills to manage their own emotions and behaviors. Um, they'll also go into a day program, the schools, anywhere where that individual um, is having some challenges and they'll do training um, to manage the behavior and educate everyone involved with that individual. They also do community trainings, so the team will go out and train the police, the EMTs, the hospitals, anyone who's gonna come in contact with individuals who have disabilities and co-occurring conditions to make sure that everybody is learning these skills, everybody has the knowledge, the expertise, and feels empowered um, to handle these individuals in the community. And it also makes sure that they're sharing resources. So we're not putting all of the burden of handling really complex cases on a service coordinator or on a single teacher. Um, it's really making sure each individual has access to all of the resources of the community um, so that things are more efficient and things are more supportive for them. Um, so we have those two teams operational currently. Um, so far they've been incredibly successful. We've seen um, since the program started a 92% drop in uh, psych admits for everyone who's been part of the program. Um, so we're really excited to have that, um, and we're hopeful um, with the budget um, coming this year that we'll be able to expand this program to other parts of the state. Okay, another piece related to safety net um, is AB 2083, uh, and this is a bill that was signed into law um, in 2018, but it really started getting rolling um, in uh, the middle of 2019. Um, and this is a law that's related to foster youth who have experienced severe trauma. 
Um, and the goal is to develop a system that's coordinated, timely, and trauma-informed um, for foster youth who cross agencies. So for us, this would be an individual who's a regional center consumer, but also a foster youth or um, engaged in the child welfare system. Um, part of the program is, or the requirements are uh, development of county MOUs. So um, memorandums of understanding that connect uh, the regional centers, um, the child welfare offices, uh, behavioral health, um, jail, probation, youth authority, everyone's coming together and making sure that they're working to support these youth. Um, for, um, oh, we also um, are doing high level technical assistance. So our department in collaboration with the Department of Social Services, um, Department of uh, Education, um, anyone who's involved with cases like this. Um, we all come together to provide technical assistance to the counties when they do have a case where they're really struggling with how do we find a placement, how do we find supports for an individual. Um, so our agency levels, we're getting together um, to come up with solutions um, when we have county partners who are saying, you know, we don't know what else to do now. Um, specific to our regional center system, um, we've also allocated positions um, at our headquarters and also at the regional centers to support this initiative. So we're gonna have staff that are specifically targeting um, the rollout of AB 2083 and making sure that all of our uh, local partners are feeling supported. And then we're also going to develop two enhanced behavioral support homes and two community crisis homes that are specific for dually served youth. So youth who have disabilities but are also involved in child welfare. We're gonna have um, those models that Tiffany just told you about um, that are gonna be available for them for placement, for stabilization. So we know um, foster youth who have disabilities tend to stay in non-ideal placements a lot longer than any other youth um, because of their special needs. Um, we know that it's harder to find foster placements for them and they tend to be less successful in those placements. So we wanted to develop um, places that we could put them that are gonna be safe, that have adequate support um, and expertise um, where they can feel safe um, until we can find them, um, hopefully a permanent family um, in the community for them. All right. The self-determination program is another uh, newer program that our department has been working on. Um, so um, starting in October of 2018, um, we began the self-determination program uh, on a pilot basis. So 2,500 individuals were selected across the state to begin participation in this program. And this program is really meant to give individuals more freedom and authority to choose the services and supports that they want. Um, so some individuals um, feel that the traditional service coordination and the way that the regional center runs maybe isn't the best fit for their needs. Um, my focus is on individuals with autism and we are seeing a lot of individuals with autism who don't really fit the, the traditional mold. So they're not gonna transition from the school system and go into a typical day program and maybe live in congregate care. They're, these are individuals who might want to go to higher education, trade school, college, uh, and then transition to um, a career. Um, so this program is, is really meant to give individuals a lot more choices in the services that they want, uh, and it gives them more freedom to control um, what their services and supports are gonna be so that they can reach their goals, um, not just kind of the status quo goals for everyone. Um, so uh, 2,500 participants were selected in fall of 2018. Currently, those individuals are being trained in um, person-centered planning, um, budgeting. They're currently developing their budgets, or a number of them do have their budgets already determined, um, and are receiving services. Um, when we hit June 7th, 2021, the program is gonna be able, or be available to um, all individuals who are eligible uh, essentially, if an individual is age three or older, um, they're gonna have the option to enroll in this program um, when we get to June 2018. Um, so, um, yeah, that's where we are. Okay. 
So overall, we are promoting best practices in our system. Um, we're building the expertise in the community. As we have an increasing number of individuals needing services and specialty care, we need to grow the expertise in California to serve the IDD population. Collectively, we want to be building the IDD expertise in clinicians and the community members, uh, such as our first responders. We're growing interest in training and working, people working in this field. Um, for example, incentivizing school programs um, for board certified behavior analysts, uh, psychologists, and physicians. We want to be using technology uh, to increase our capacity to serve individuals. We want to ensure our delivery is culturally and linguistically competent. Okay, so in the vein of um, promoting best practices, um, we are really interested in promoting best practices for specialty care. So specialty care um, with uh, clinicians and service providers who have expertise in um, working with individuals with developmental disabilities and co-occurring conditions. Um, we're starting to see some efforts um, by the regional centers uh, to do this. So um, one example, uh, in North Bay Regional Center's catchment area, we have a federally qualified health center, or FQHC, uh, and this is a comprehensive clinic um, that provides a full array of services, so primary care, um, specialty care, preventative medicine, uh, dental. Um, so they have all of those services. They have clinicians who are experienced in working with this population. Um, and it's also being used as a training site. So students um, from the San Francisco area are coming to uh, the FQHC to learn um, how can I be a provider who's able to uh, serve individuals with developmental disabilities in my practice. Um, so that's a really exciting new um, program that has come online recently. Um, I also want to mention uh, in the San Gabriel Pomona Regional Center catchment um, area, they have a dental desensitization clinic. And the clinic is actually um, at the regional center's headquarters. Um, and they have a mock dental room set up there. And essentially what happens is an individual who has experienced difficulty accessing dental care before um, can sign up to come to the mock clinic. Um, and it's, it looks just like a dental clinic. It has all the tools, uh, the dental chair, um, and they will take as many sessions as it takes for that individual to learn, um, you know, what is it like to go to the dentist? What are they gonna do? What are the steps involved? Um, and there's a BCBA um, and a couple other staff there who are super patient and work with the individual through all of those steps um, with the goal of um, that knowledge being generalized to other dental clinics. So after an individual goes through this program as many times as needed, they graduate and then hopefully they can go to a community dental practitioner um, for their dental care uh, with the ultimate goal of having dental care without generalized anesthesia. Um, and they've already seen a handful of individuals who've gone through this program and are now successfully receiving dental care uh, without anesthesia. So we're really, really excited to see um, that program um, rolling out and, and having such great results. Um, so we're hopeful as a department that uh, across the state we're gonna be able to see more programs like the FQHC and the Dental Desensitization Clinic um, so that more individuals have access to specialty care. Uh, in the community. We also want to make sure the services we're developing are reflective of a changing population. So I showed you really quickly through the data at the beginning, um, we, we're seeing changing demographics uh, of the population that we serve. So um, individuals are, are more diverse. We have a lot of languages being spoken. Um, we're seeing a growing aging population. Um, people with disabilities who are getting older need more care. Um, we uh, see a massively growing population of individuals with autism and individuals with disabilities who have co-occurring conditions. Um, so the need for services is there, it's growing. We want to make sure that as we're developing these specialty services um, that they're able to meet the needs of a really diverse population. 
Um, and then finally, um, I want to mention our developmental services task force. Uh, we reconstituted this task force um, at the end of 2019. So um, we have uh, work groups that are specific to the areas that we talked about today. Um, and the task force brings together um, state agencies, community members, self-advocates um, to discuss and plan for the future of our system. Um, and one thing that we're really interested in is getting um, stakeholder input that can help us guide how we're going to reach these best practices for the state. Um, and we really want to engage diverse stakeholders and particularly self-advocates with disabilities. Um, we tend to see less engagement from those groups, but we're really hoping um, we can get more and more input from those groups um, so that they can really be guiding where we're headed with the system so that everything is, is there to support them. Um, so I think that's the end of that. See? Yeah? Okay. Um, so um, with that, I want to thank you all for uh, listening. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please come find me. I'll be here all day.